l'audio mensile per mantenere e migliorare il tuo inglese. Speak up! Speak up in English! Speak up! Speak up! All over the world! Speak up! Speak up! In Britain and America! Speak up! Speak up! Speak up! In Africa! And India! Speak up! In Ireland! New Zealand and Australia! Speak Up cassettes are designed to enable you to understand all the varieties of spoken English. On this cassette, you will hear an exclusive interview with Rex Cowan, one of Europe's leading explorers of sunken treasure, followed by the world of English, armchair detective, where you are asked to solve a new mystery, and the Grosskopf file. But now, here is Tom Boyd to introduce the Speak Up interview. Rex Cowan is one of the two or three professional wreck hunters in Europe today. I would normally have said treasure hunters, but he asked me not to, as he feels that the term treasure hunter has a mercenary and perhaps over-romantic sound to it that trivializes the seriousness and archaeological importance of his expeditions. What he does, in fact, is to discover the location of the wrecks, that is, the remains of ships which sank in the distant past, then lead a team of specialist divers using sophisticated scientific equipment and techniques and bring up from the bed of the sea all the items and artifacts that have survived two or three hundred years of salt water, sand, mud, and corrosion. Some of the things he finds are only treasures to archaeologists and museums, but other items are treasures in everyone's eyes, such as his most recent discovery off the coast of Holland a complete chest containing 2,000 rare gold coins valued at nearly a half a million dollars. Rex Cowan has found six or seven previously undiscovered shipwrecks, one of them in Mauritius dating back to 1615. His speciality is hunting for sunken East Indiamen, that is, the sailing ships which regularly went back and forth between Europe and the Far East for trade during the days of European colonies and empires. Many of these great ships met disaster on the rocks, sandbanks, and reefs off the rugged coast of Britain and Holland, and Rex Cowan is a recognized authority on this subject, writing books and articles for magazines and giving lectures all over the world. Before he became a wreck hunter, he was for some 11 years a lawyer in London. I asked him why he decided to give up a secure career in a law office and take up a risky and sometimes dangerous life at sea. Uh, I didn't actually drop out from being a lawyer to become uh, a wreck hunter. I woke up one morning and said, uh, this is no way to spend the rest of your life, and if you don't stop now, you'll get in a rut and you'll be unable to get out of it. So I decided to stop being a lawyer, but I didn't decide what else I was going to be. Um, so I, I made arrangements with my partners and I arrived home and said to my wife, here I am, I have no more job, no more function. I have to stick the stamps on my own envelopes. I don't know what I'm going to do, but I suppose I shall have to take the children to school in the mornings and help with the washing up. And what led you to start searching for sunken ships? I started to write for the newspapers, which is something I'd always wanted to do. And one day the Financial Times said to me, this Royal Navy team of divers has just found a shipwreck on the Isles of Scilly. Will you go down and cover the story for us? And that's exactly what I did. And when I ju jumped aboard the Royal Navy minesweeper, where all these men were, and spent a day with them and saw what they were doing, I said, that's the life for me. And that's how it happened. Complete coincidence, accidental. I knew nothing about diving or wreck hunting or anything at all. I just knew that was the right smell. So I pointed my head in that direction. And how do you locate these ships? Do you do a lot of research? Well, the first thing is, of course, that you find them on paper. You find them in the archives, you find them in the libraries, you find them um, in the old dusty documents. When you found them there, then you translate that into a uh, physical action and you start to look for them actually in the areas in which they're supposed to be, having got either a rough approximation or an exact position for where, at any rate, you think they are. And once you locate the ships and start diving, what objects do you find? 
Well, don't forget that these ships were really floating villages. Aboard them were perhaps up to three or four hundred people, that's soldiers and sailors and merchants. And so they carried all their personal possessions with them, like a, like a village. The voyages would take from five to eight months. And then, of course, when they got to the Indies, they would need their personal possessions as well. So you divide the sort of material you find into several categories. There's the trading cargo. That's, that could be anything, uh, bricks, wood, lead, and, of course, on the East Indiaman, silver and gold. Personal objects, that's absolutely everything that you would need. Knives, forks, spoons, combs, clothing, uh, furniture. Or, and then you have technical things like navigational instruments, armament. You have pistols uh, and rifles, uh, cannons. Off the last vessel that we found, the Fliegenhard, off the coast of Holland, we've recovered almost 200 bottles of wine, it complete and intact with the wine, both red and white, and I'm told uh, uh, Madeira and Sherry are uh, still in, him, in them, and almost drinkable. What's the most unusual object you've ever found? Well, I think probably the, the rarest object that we've found is uh, 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 the rarest objects are navigational instruments, uh, uh, very early navigational instruments for that period. Uh, uh, Hadley's octant and a plane scale made by Van Curlen, uh, one of the most famous cartographers. That's a, a sort of a slide rule. I think that uh, the most remarkable things, that the most exciting things that I found, the last exciting thing was the complete chest wooden chest full of gold and silver. I, I must admit that's the most exciting and interesting because it symbolized uh, the conquest of the East by trading monies. It was much more the monies than the physical power actually that conquered the East. Is there great excitement when they when something is brought to the surface? Yes, yes, there is. That's that's what uh, divers feed off, the, the uniqueness of bringing material up to the surface that nobody has ever seen before or touched before for a long time. And uh, if a remarkable object is, is found, um, uh, even things like up in the Isles of Orkney on the Swedish East Indian, there were textiles coming back from India. And every now and again, somebody would find a tiny piece, a few shreds of Indian textiles. And everybody would get very excited over even seeing those. So it's not just the treasure or the gold or the silver, or the beautiful objects. We find many beautiful objects as well. Now, do these things disintegrate when they, yes, when they hit the air? Yes, we have, we work with an archaeological orientation. Uh, we have uh, three academically trained diving archaeologists, and we have a team of conservators for conservation, because there's no point in bringing up things from the seabed that were just going to rot away. And we have in Holland a conservation laboratory now. Let me explain what we do. Before we touch anything, we carry out a survey of the seabed, of the remains we can see. It's what's called in archaeological terms a pre-disturbance survey. Because once you start to dig into a wreck, you destroy it. So you have to get the information before you start to destroy it. You have to survey it. Then once we've surveyed it, we decide on our plan for what's called a controlled excavation. Then we start to dig in an area which we generally mark off with a grid so we can record where it came from and we understand the context in which everything comes up. We get the stuff up by a variety of means, digging with hands, with small hand tools, or with chisels, using an airlift, which is just a great sucker. It sucks everything up, sand and water up or using sometimes small, very careful, explosive charges so that you break away the material uh, and can bring it up, uh, whereas otherwise you couldn't uh, detach it because shipwrecks are baked into the seabed, some of them, like a big hard cake made of rock. It's a slow process, slow and expensive process. But that's the way, that's the way that you retrieve the best for history and that's the way that you actually get the most satisfaction. And then what do you do with the, with the treasures? Well, we try to ensure that museums acquire them one way or the other, so that most of the cultural heritage, the historical heritage of, this, of the maritime periods, stay in the appropriate countries. So that in Holland, of course, the museums are full of material which I've, I've recovered from shipwrecks and one or two things are to be seen in English museums as well.
Now, who actually owns these ships? Well, the Dutch ships. I enter into contracts with the Dutch government, who are the successor in law in, in Holland of the Dutch East India Company, so they own the ships, and they can deal with them, and they enter into contracts with me in which I, I get the ownership of the ships, and I give them a cut of what we get. I've read that your agreement with the Dutch government about the profits from the treasures you found on the ship, the Fliegendhardt, caused you a lot of trouble in Holland, both with the Dutch press and public opinion. Why was there so much animosity? Well, we'd been working, we spent almost three years searching for this wreck using a magnetometer, which is an electronic instrument that measures the Earth's magnetic field. We then spent another two and a half years on surveying it and controlling the excavation carefully and setting up the whole archaeological historical complex with the Rijksmuseum in Holland and in a uh, uh, town in the south of Holland, Vlissingham, where we had our, our laboratory, our conservation, and where all the experts and the divers lived. By June of this year, it had cost somewhere in the region, the value of the work was almost a, a quarter of a million pounds, a lot of money, and a great deal of risk and personal risk as well, as well as work had gone into it. The Dutch government's contract said they would get 25% of the gross that's 25% of anything that came up before any expenses came out of it. And at that time also, the site had been, our archaeological work had been destroyed three times by Dutch trawlers coming over trying to grab material from the site. And also, as we found out later, by Dutch divers. So we and the site were being, the site was being attacked. Uh, we were running at a, at a loss, it was costing us a tremendous amount of money. We were running it as a training school for the Dutch divers so that one day they could do the same things themselves because it was mainly English divers uh, who were involved. And we came to the point at which we just weren't going to carry on anymore. I went to, to the Dutch government and I said, firstly, we want you to help us protect the site and secondly, we want you to give us a chance to recoup our costs. So we want you to reduce your commission for 1983 and 1984 from 25 to 10%. And they quite properly said, yes, we'd rather have 10% of something than 25% of nothing. And they then sent a gunboat onto the site and police boats uh, to help protect it. And that was fine. And we continued working. And we were one week uh, before the end of our summer season, the end of July, and the divers found what appeared to be uh, part of a wooden box and we excavated it for four or five days and by that time I had a, a, a strong suspicion what it was and then we brought it up. It was a chance and unexpected find and there we had this wonderful chest full of gold and silver. The chest contained probably around 7,500 pieces of eight silver cobs uh, minted in Mexico City and 2,000 Dutch gold ducats. And of course the Dutch press immediately implied that we had outsmarted the Dutch government, uh, that the English were only after the money and not interested in the boat. At the same time some factions in Holland that wanted to attack the Ministry of Finance because it felt that it didn't, it wasn't the right organization to handle the cultural heritage, used us as an example to fire over uh, over our heads in a Dutch political battle and we were made to look like the villains which is of course it was never justified that sort of thing is not unexpected I knew when that chest came up that gold excites people beyond their self-control and not us I mean the public the press and even the museum people is there more to find on, on the... Uh, yes, Vigantar? yes, the whole of that ship is still there. Uh, it's going to be a long and very complicated uh, excavation. Oh, more wonders, and not gold and silver wonders, but other wonders are to come. What will you be looking for next? Well, I'm going up as a sort of pilgrimage, as I do each year, to an island off the Shetlands called Fula, which is a great mountain island. And really I'm going there because it's such a lovely, remarkable place and because I prefer northern to southern climates. We are really going there to have a look at the other Titanic, the sister ship of the Titanic, called the Oceanic, which uh, hit a reef and sank there early in the century.
Then I'm headed for the Caribbean to do a reconnaissance. Uh, I should be working off the Isles of Scilly in the very early part of the year. And then, of course, returning to Holland. And what is your greatest ambition? What would you most like to find? I would like to find an English East Indiaman uh, of a period that symbolised the most important era of the English colonisation and exploitation of India. Do you have one in mind? Hmm. But you don't want to say? Well, I don't encourage anybody. <laughs> it's a great ship with a great story and a charismatic Englishman involved. And you have an idea where it is? Yeah, I think I know exactly where it is. <laughs> it's an awful and very inaccessible part of the world, not to be recommended for anybody. Good luck. I hope you find it. Well, thank you very much. It was a pleasure. The World of English, part two of the United States of America, in which you will hear American speech from all over the USA, as well as a selection of prose, poetry, and important writing from great American authors, and a concise history of the United States from its colonial beginnings to its present position as an industrial giant and superpower. Here is part two, continued. After nearly 200 years of being part of the British Empire, America fought the mother country and won its independence in what Americans call the Revolution. But independence was not the goal of the war. King George III was uninterested in the American colonies and needed money for the expensive ships and soldiers that protected his empire. The British Parliament imposed a series of taxes on the American colonies to pay for defence. And Americans, feeling that the tax was unfair, refused to pay and demanded equal status within the empire and democratic representation. In other words, their rights as Englishmen. Even after the war had broken out, separation from the British crown was unthinkable and up to six months before July the 4th, 1776, America's Independence Day, General Washington and his officers were drinking to the health of the king in the officers' mess every night. But ill-feeling and bitterness grew rapidly, and finally there were no other options. Thomas Jefferson was asked to write what is now the United States' most sacred and eloquent document, the Declaration of Independence. But in the course of human events, it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands which have connected them with one another and to assume amongst the powers of the earth the equal station to which the laws of nature and of nature's God entitle them. A decent respect to the opinions of mankind requires that they should declare the causes which impel them to the separation. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they have been endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Yankee Doodle went to town a-riding on a pony He stuck a feather in his cap and called it macaroni Yankee Doodle keep it up, Yankee Doodle dandy Mind the music and the step and with the girls be handy Is the tune Americans delight in Will do the whistle, sing or play And just the thing for fighting Yankee Doodle, keep it up Yankee Doodle dandy Mind the music and the step And with the girls be handy In 1626, the Indians sold Manhattan Island To Dutch settlers for about $40 And it was called New Amsterdam 
By the end of the 17th century, it was taken over by the British and became New York. But a certain amount of Dutch influence and several prominent Dutch families remained, one of which gave the US two presidents, Theodore and Franklin D. Roosevelt. Another became governor, but is best known today for the cigarettes that bear his name, Peter Stuyvesant. And yet another, the legendary Rip Van Winkle, who, in the story by Washington Irving, slept through the American Revolution. He went up into the Catskill Mountains, fell asleep for 20 years, and emerged to find everything changed. He now hurried forth to his old resort, the King George Inn. Over the door was painted the Union Hotel. Instead of the great tree that used to shelter the quiet little inn, there was now a tall naked pole, and from it was fluttering a flag on which there was a singular assemblage of stars and stripes, all this was strange and incomprehensible. He recognized on the sign, however, the ruby face of King George III, under which he had smoked so many a peaceful pipe, but even this was changed. The king's red coat was painted blue, and a sword was held in his hand instead of a scepter, and underneath was painted in large characters, General Washington. Well, there was, as usual, a crowd of folk about the door, but the very character of the people seemed changed. A lean, bilious-looking fellow with his pocket filled with handbills was haranguing vehemently about rights of citizens, election, members of Congress, liberty, and other words that bewildered Van Winkle. People crowded around Rip with great curiosity, and one inquired, on which side he voted. Rip stared in vacant stupidity. Another short but busy little fellow pulled him by the arm and, rising on tiptoe, inquired whether he was a federal or a democrat. Alas, gentlemen, cried Rip, I am but a poor, quiet man, a native of the place, and a loyal subject of the king, God bless him. Here a general shout burst from the bystanders. A Tory, a Tory, a spy, away with him. Rip cried out in despair, Does anybody here know Rip Van Winkle? Rip's story was soon told, for the whole twenty years had been to him as one night. It was some time, however, before he could comprehend the strange events that had taken place during his sleep. How that there had been a revolutionary war, that the country had thrown off the yoke of old England, and that instead of being a subject of His Majesty George III, he was now a free citizen of the United States. With the war over and independence won, the four million Americans rolled up their shirt sleeves and went to work to create the most prosperous country on earth. John Henry was a little baby boy. You could hold him in the palm of your hand. He gave a long and lonesome cry. I'm gonna be a steel driving man, Lord, Lord. I'm gonna be a steel driving man. John Henry started on the right hand, the steam drill started on the left. For I let that steam drill beat me down, I'd hammer my fool self to death, Lord, Lord, hammer my fool self to death. I hear America singing. The varied carols I hear, those of mechanics, each one singing his as it should be, blithe and strong. The carpenter singing his as he measures his plank or beam. The mason singing his as he makes ready for work, or leaves off work. The boatman singing what belongs to him in his boat. The deckhand singing on the steamboat deck. The shoemaker singing as he sits on his bench, the hatter singing as he stands. The woodcutter's song, the plowboy's on his way in the morning, or at noon into mission, or at sundown. The delicious singing of the mother, or of the young wife at work, or of the girl sewing or washing. Each singing what belongs to him or her, and to none else. The day what belongs to the day. At night, the party of young fellows, robust, friendly, singing with open mouths their strong melodious songs. John Henry hammering in the mountain till the handle of his hammer cut on fire. He drove so hard that he broke his poor heart and he lied down his hammer and died, Lord, Lord. 
He laid down his hammer and died. White man's relations with the Native American Indians began reasonably well, and they had been included in the Puritan's first Thanksgiving dinner. The American poet Longfellow describes how the Indians felt at the coming of the Pale Faces in his epic poem, The Song of Hiawatha. In a great canoe with pinions came, he said, a hundred warriors. Painted white were all their faces, and with hair their chins were covered. And the warriors and the women laughed and shouted in derision. Caw, they said, what lies you tell us. Do not think that we believe them. Only Hiawatha laughed not. But he gravely spoke and answered, True is all Iagu tells us. I have seen them in a vision. Let us welcome them, the strangers. Hail them as our friends and brothers. And the heart's right hand of friendship give them when they come to see us. I beheld, too, in that vision, all the secrets of the future. All the land was full of people, restless, struggling, toiling, striving, speaking many tongues, yet feeling but one heartbeat in their bosoms. Then a darker, drearer vision passed before me, vague and cloud-like. I beheld our nation scattered, weakened, warring with each other, saw the remnants of our people sweeping westward, wild and woeful, like the cloud rack of a tempest, like the withered leaves of autumn. But as the Europeans took away more and more of their hunting grounds, the Indians became hostile, which is understandable enough, for it was their land. Eventually, they were pushed back into other territories or were killed or died off in large numbers. James Fenimore Cooper writes about this sad chapter in American history. Did white man say to the Indians, brother, sell us your land and take this gold, this silver, these blankets, these rifles, or even this rum? No. They tore it from him, as a scalp is torn from an enemy. And they that did it looked not behind them, to see whether he lived or died. The pale faces are masters of the earth, and the time of the red man has not yet come again. My day has been too long. Before the night has come, I have lived to see the last warrior of the wise race of the Mohicans. Swing low. African slaves were brought to America in 1619 and became essential labor for the great cotton and rice plantations in the South. By the end of the century, there were nearly a million Negroes, or blacks as they now prefer to be called, owned by white families. They were the personal property of their owners, just like furniture or dogs or horses, and could be sold or passed down from father to son by their masters. Converted to Christianity, their fervent belief in the salvation of Jesus and their natural gift for music helped ease the wretchedness of their lives. By the early part of the 19th century, slavery had been abolished in many of the northern states. In Massachusetts, also known as the Bay State, abolitionist feelings were expressed by its native poet, John Greenleaf Whittier. No slave hunt in our borders, no pirate on our strand, no fetters in the Bay State, no slave upon our land. Nobody knows the trouble I see. Nobody knows but Jesus. But the southern states resisted any attempts to stop the flow of blacks from Africa. And by 1860, there were four million slaves supporting the economy of the prosperous South. 
As the famous black singer Paul Robeson said, I speak as one, as I say, whose fathers and whose mothers toiled in cotton, toiled in tobacco, toiled in indigo, toiled to create the basic wealth upon which the great land of the United States was built. The great primary wealth came from the blood and from the suffering of my forefathers. Many slaves were lucky enough to run away to the north, where they were often protected by sympathetic whites. Mark Twain writes about a young runaway slave boy, Jim, who is befriended by Huckleberry Finn in his classic novel. I told Jim about Louis XVI that got his head cut off in France, and about his little boy, the dolphin. Some says he got away and come to America. Jim says, that's good but he'll be pretty lonesome. There ain't no kings here, is there, Huck? No. Then he can't get no situation, no work. What he gonna do? Well, I don't know. Some of them joins the police, and some of them learns people how to talk French. Why, Huck, don't the French people talk the same way we does? No, Jim, you couldn't understand a word they said, not a single word. I got some of their jabber out of a book. Suppose a man was to come up to you and say, Polyvoo Franzi. What would you think? I wouldn't think nothing. I'd bust him over the head, that is, if he weren't white. I wouldn't allow no nigger to call me that. Shucks, it ain't calling you anything. It's just saying, do you know how to talk French? Well, then why couldn't he say it? Well, he is saying it. That's a Frenchman's way of saying it. Well, that's a ridiculous way, and I don't want to hear no more about it. There ain't no sense in it. Looky here, Jim. Does a cat talk like we do? Or a cow? No, they don't. And ain't it natural and right for a cat and a cow to talk different from us? Course. Well then, why ain't it natural for a Frenchman to talk different from us? You answer me that. Is a cat a man, Huck? No. Is a cow a man? Course not. Well, they ain't got no business talking like a man. Is a Frenchman a man? Yes. Well then, Dad, blame it, why don't he talk like a man? You answer me that. I could see it wasn't no use wasting words. You can't learn a nigger to argue, so I quit. In 1859, a white anti-slavery leader, John Brown, broke into an arsenal in Virginia, armed the slaves, and led a rebellion. It was suppressed by General Robert E. Lee, and Brown was captured, tried, and hanged. But he became a martyr and hero of the abolitionists. From Stephen Vincent Benet's poem, John Brown's Body, here are John Brown's last words addressed to the court and judge that sentenced him to death. If it is deemed necessary that I should forfeit my life for the furtherance of the ends of justice and mingle my blood with the blood of millions in the slave country whose rights are disregarded by wicked, cruel and unjust enactments, I say let it be done. I, John Brown, am now quite certain that the crimes of this guilty land will never be purged away, but with blood. John Brown's body lies a molded in the grave. John Brown's body lies a molded in the grave. John Brown's body lies a molded in the grave. But his soul goes marching on. Two years later, Abraham Lincoln was elected 16th President of the United States. The election of an anti-slavery president was enough to cause the southern states to leave the Union and form a separate confederacy in order to preserve their states' rights. And so the American Civil War began. <laughs> Drums blow, bugles blow, through the windows, through doors, burst like a ruthless force into the solemn church and scatter the congregation, into the school where the scholar is studying. 
Leave not the bridegroom quiet. No happiness must he have now with his bride, nor the peaceful farmer any peace, plowing his field or gathering his grain. So fierce you whir and pound you drums, so shrill you bugles blow. It was four years before the northern armies were successful, the southerners were crushed, and slavery was abolished. The turning point of the war was the defeat of General Lee's army at the Battle of Gettysburg in Pennsylvania. Abraham Lincoln went to the scene of this victory and gave one of the most famous speeches in the English language, known as the Gettysburg Address. Four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation, conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Now we are engaged in a great civil war, testing whether that nation or any nation so conceived and so dedicated can long endure. We are met on a great battlefield of that war. We have come to dedicate a portion of that field as a final resting place for those who here gave their lives that the nation might live. It is altogether fitting and proper that we should do this. But in a larger sense, we cannot dedicate, we cannot consecrate, we cannot hallow this ground. The brave men, living and dead, who struggled here have consecrated it far above our poor power to add or detract. The world will little note nor long remember what we say here, but it can never forget what they did here. It is for us, the living rather, to be dedicated here to the unfinished work which they who fought here have thus far so nobly advanced. It is rather for us to be here dedicated to the great task remaining before us, that from these honored dead we take increased devotion to the cause for which they gave the last full measure of devotion, that we here highly resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain, that this nation under God shall have a new birth of freedom, and that government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth. of the West and its promise of a new life has always been one of the strongest myths of America. Throughout the 19th century, Americans pushed the frontier further and further to the plains of Kansas, Iowa and Nebraska, to the Rocky Mountains of Colorado and Wyoming, to the salt flats of Utah, across the deserts of Nevada and Arizona, and finally to the golden sunny shores of California. It is incredible now when you can speed from the Atlantic to the Pacific Oceans on superhighways to think of the early pioneers crossing the immense American continent in horse-drawn wagons through unmapped territories. These brave souls endured unimaginable hardships, extreme temperatures, famine, drought and Indian massacres to stake claims on land, search for gold or simply to find a new life. Go west, young man, and grow up with the country, said Horace Greeley in 1846, and thousands did. Did you ever hear of sweet Betsy from Pack, who crossed the wide prairie with her lover Ike, with two yoke of cattle and one spotted hog, a tall Shanghai rooster and an old yellow dog, sing to a la ooh, a la ooh, a la -e. Sing to a la ooh, a la ooh, a la -e. They swam the wild rivers and they climbed the tall peaks. They camped on the prairies for weeks and for weeks. Starvation and cholera, hard work and slaughter. They reached California, spot of hell and high water. Sing to a la ooh, a la ooh, a la -e. Sing to a la ooh, a la ooh, a la -e. We cross the prairie, as of old the pilgrims crossed the sea, to make the West, as they the East, the homestead of the free. The pioneering spirit and the myth of a better life in the West is still strong in the USA. 
and accounts for the spectacular population growth of California. It may also account for the national urge to put an American on the moon, outer space being the new western frontier. Not least of the lures of the West is the great myth of the cowboy, the strong man alone with nature, his horse and his gun, which has prompted a whole genre of fiction, Western films and television series, not to mention advertising, for the Wild West is Marlborough cigarette country. Oh, give me a home where the buffalo roam and the deer and the antelope play. Where seldom is heard a discouraging word And the skies are not cloudy all day Home, home on the range Where the deer and the antelope play Where seldom is heard a discouraging word And the skies are not cloudy all day But the myth of the cowboy taking the law into his own hands and solving disputes with a Smith and Wesson revolver may have a lot to answer for in modern America. In 1978, for example, 12,000 Americans were murdered by firearms. In England and Wales during the same year, the total of shooting incidents was 35. Even after he was shot, President Reagan proclaimed that he was against the limitation or control on the sale or ownership of firearms. The reasons for this remain a mystery to other civilized countries, so we asked an American high school teacher, Jim McGovern, to discuss this subject with some of his teenage students. It seems to me that much of the, the, the gun idea, the idea of the gun, which has been glorified and is part of the mythology, the American mythology, it goes back long and deep. I mean, we were all weaned on westerns and uh, right. cops and robbers. That's and uh, right. I suppose the deeper question is, is there a genetic or a behaviorally induced uh, violence in, in the American character? I don't know. What do you think, Paul? What's, what's the actual standing of gun control in the states now? It varies from state to state. Some states have absolutely none. States like New York have a very strict uh, rule on the books and they enforce it. However, people can come in from outer state with guns. It's strict in Massachusetts, but you can get them. I don't know if there's any in Texas, is there? Well, you can have a gun. There's yeah. not, there's hardly any gun control. My neighbors yeah. had a lot in, in, in Boston, actually. Did they? The neighbors had them and they didn't have much use for them, but it was... Uh, it was there. It was the sense of security, I suppose. Oh. How about you? Are you from Texas? Yeah. We lived on a ranch. Mm -hmm. You need it, really. In Texas, you can shoot somebody for trespass. Where do you buy a gun? You just go to the gun store. <laughs> <laughs> Next to the Safeway. Between the liquor store. Between the liquor store and the Safeway. I think if I lived in New York City today, I, I would like to have a gun in the house locked in a special drawer in case the, the burglar didn't right. come in because I know today that he'll have a gun himself. Yeah. I remember driving across the United States in my old beat-up Chevy with my family, and I had the gun up underneath the dashboard. I have to admit, it gave me a sense of security, no question about it. Does anybody think that they can foresee a time when gun control will either become mandatory or when a, Americans in general will be in favor of it? No way. No way. No. Be a long time. Be a long time. Mm -hmm. Paul, what do you think? I think the same thing be a long time, but I don't think there should be a complete gun control. There's got to be a limit to that. Yes, if it, if it came in, it might be partial. I suppose there might be a time when, when handgun control would be possible, but I'm not sure. As for rifles, I doubt it. Well, I guess this brings us back to that old American uh, resentment of, of uh, a, an all-powerful government. And, of course, anyone who's anti-communist, deeply anti-communist, would raise the specter of they're, they're disarming us. Because there is an element in the Constitution, the right to bear arms, which, of course, would have to be reinterpreted. And to tamper with the Constitution, again, goes against the American right. conception of things. Would you shoot someone who broke in the house if you had a gun? Yes, if you broke in. What if he was not armed? Oh, I wouldn't know that. I mean, if you broke you shouldn't in. Have broke well, in. well if, if the killings of the Kennedys, of Martin Luther King, and then of people on the other side, Reagan and Wallace, have not catapulted us into this confrontation, I surely don't know what will. We're becoming numb to the whole, the whole yes. assassination idea, the whole criminal 
concept we're becoming numb to it and we're, we're starting to, to read about assassination attempts and murders and, and just skimming through them they don't shock us anymore well, i mean it's the simple fact of the matter is that our heroes were we're still a very young nation and our heroes are heroes of the frontier still and uh, those images are deeply engraved in our in our nature and um it's the cowboy and the american is still alive and well it takes time for civilizations to evolve. The Renaissance man is not our hero yet. Tell us of all this. <laughs> The United States is far too big and too complex to do it justice in one hour, or even in many hours. What of American achievements? The USA has won more Nobel Prizes than any other country, and an American, Thomas Edison, invented not only the electric light, but the means of recording the human voice that led to your being able to hear me now. But apart from technology, American influence, for better or sometimes for worse, has left its mark on the modern world. All over Europe and the industrial countries of Asia and other places, the supermarket, shopping centers and chain stores and restaurants are testimony to American expertise in marketing, advertising and promotion. The exploitation of mass consumer products. No civilization has escaped blue jeans and Coca-Cola and if the United States has never reached the cultural heights of Europe, Asia and the Islamic world at its peak, American pop culture has certainly left its impact all over the globe. The simple fact that the United States can arouse among foreigners such strong feelings, both pro and anti, is a sure sign of the country's influence and position, which even its greatest detractors must acknowledge. If the British Empire was responsible for spreading the English language all over the world, the American preeminence in so many fields has greatly contributed to its international importance today. And now the Grosskopf file. In this episode, Dr. Grosskopf is at a travel agency in London, booking his flight to America. I would like to book a flight to New York on Tuesday morning with Lufthansa Airlines. I'm afraid you can't fly from London to New York on Lufthansa. And why not? I always fly Lufthansa everywhere when my company is paying. And when you pay? I never pay. I am an academic. Only British Airways, Pan American and TWA have daily flights. I want the one that leaves first thing in the morning. You can go by British Airways Concord at 10.30 a.m., but you have to be at Heathrow to check in at 9.30. Is that too early? Madam, I am out of my bed at 5 o'clock every morning doing my exercises. Stretch two, three, bend two, three. One way or return? One way. From New York I go back to Dusseldorf by Lufthansa. That's one way on Concord, leaving London at 10.30 a.m., arriving New York at 9.30 a.m. Oh, oh, I arrive before I leave. That is what you call making time. Name, please? Dr. Reinhard Grosskopf. Gross, that means big. Kopf, that means head. In English, I am Dr. Big Head. <laughs> Are you paying in cash? Send the bill to Aquapet in Dusseldorf. I never carry money, just like your queen. I'm afraid we'll have to have payment before we can issue a ticket. Then here is a credit card. And here is your ticket. Thank you. And you have been so kind. I shall give you this little book for a present. Oh, thank you. Underwater Friends by Dr. Reinhard Grosskopf. In this book, I have written all there is to say about goldfish. Goldfish? Goldfish. Good day, madam. And now, armchair detective, where you try to solve the mysteries and murders in the small English village of Abington Frith, 
Can you solve this latest crime? Into thin air. The Countess Karamazova and her jewels were a source of much gossip in Abington Frith. How was it possible that she had managed to get her hands on what had once been a portion of the Russian crown jewels? Professor Plum, Colonel Mustard and Reverend Green spent countless hours in the perfect days talking about what they could do if only they could get their hands on the gems. The Countess was persuaded by members of the Robin Hood Club to put her jewellery on show for charity, including the fabulous pendant weighing nearly 30 carats. Being generous and trusting, up to a point, anyhow, and having over-insured them, she exhibited the jewels among the treasures at Tudor Close and let the good people of Abington Frith stare, touch, and hopefully envy. Special security guards were hired to stand watch over the jewel. But when some of the small boys' balloons exploded with a series of bangs, and as a result, he went into a tantrum. <laughs> they, as well as everyone in the room, turned around to find out what the trouble was. Then, seeing the Countess, who was just making her entrance, the guards let their gazes linger. By the time they turned back, the pendant had disappeared. The Countess cried out, My diamond! A kink gave it to me. And under her breath, she murmured, It's irreplaceable. After all, how many kinks are left? At least, the kind who hand out diamonds. The sketch shows the hall immediately after the pendant disappeared. Can you tell who swiped the pendant and how it disappeared? We hope that you have enjoyed the Speak Up cassette and have furthered your knowledge and understanding of English. The next number contains Tom Boyd's exclusive interview with the political thriller writer Frederick Forsyth, plus the world of English, armchair detective and the gross cop file. Hear it all in the next issue of Speak Up. Speak Up in English wherever you are.